Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to you guys that are here live. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church here online. So glad you're able to tune in and join us here tonight. I don't know where I would be without the book of Psalms. And I just really look forward to the opportunity to talk about Psalms with other people. I start every day of my life, pretty much, uh, by reading one and meditating on a little bit and trying to sort of pray through the, the portions of it that I can. Um, so I've been trying to lately kind of move our Acts studies on to Sunday mornings to just keep a little bit of continuity there. That seemed in the passage we studied this past Sunday to be the, the best thing. So we go back into the Psalms tonight, and I have one that I'm just very eager to share with you as I thought it through myself. Um, we're in Psalm 54. So if you want to open your Bible to Psalm 54, you can do that. And I can tell you that almost right away, we're going to be flipping to 1 Samuel chapter 23. Psalm 54 is one of the Psalms that in the title gives us a, uh, a bit of historic context, which allows us to cross-reference it to a story in the biblical narrative that preceded its writing. There are a bunch of them like that, and that's a that's a really interesting study in and of itself, just to read those and to, to look into that and compare them to the, the scripture passages that they seem to have uh, originated from. So uh, we're going to do that tonight. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then I will read Psalm 54, and then we'll flip back to 1 Samuel 23. I'm so glad that you're all with us tonight. It's a great opportunity to be together in God's word. Let's pray, everybody. Our Father, most holy Lord God, you are the Lord. You are Lord Yahweh. You are Yahweh, the only God, the true living God. We come to you, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You, Lord Jesus, are the Holy Son of God. You are God in the flesh. Amen. You came and you gave your life and received in your body the justice of the Father against sin. And you died bearing what we deserved, really, for our sinfulness, you having never sinned yourself. You died as a sacrifice for us to set us free from sin's consequence, which is death and eternal judgment in hell. But now we have the reconciliation to God through you, the mediator, the advocate, our Savior, our Lord. You rose from the dead, you ascended back to the Father, and you sent the Holy Spirit. And we ask you, the Lord God, the Holy Spirit, as you live in us, to just as our Lord Jesus said, to teach us and to guide us, to magnify the glory of the Father and the, the beauty of the gospel of, of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. As we read and study the word tonight, we pray that we would be edified and encouraged. You call us after you have saved us to serve you. We read tonight about David, one of your famous servants from the past, the man after your own heart, how you called him to serve you. And even as he obeyed you, the consequence of his obedience and even his victory was that people turned on him. Well, that experience, as hard as that must have been for David, seems to have given birth to this psalm, Lord God. And we are thankful to have that insight that we may glean from it in the ministry of your Holy Spirit what we ought to learn that we might be encouraged and edified. I thank you for all who are listening tonight, and I pray that we would all be built up in the faith. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's start with Psalm 54, and you can see that uh, there's a rather lengthy title, which is part of the inspired text of the Scripture, To the Chief Musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, 
is David not hiding with us? So we can refer back to 1 Samuel 23 and even a little bit of 1 Samuel 26 to read that, which we will in a moment. But let's go ahead. It's a short psalm. Let's go ahead and read these seven verses of this psalm first. Ready? And then we'll take a look at the story that it came out of and then come back and go through the psalm. Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, Yahweh, for it is good, for he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Praise the Lord. Now, right before we flip back to uh, 1 Samuel 23, let me just point out there are three clear breaks, I think, in the psalm. One of them is actually ends with a selah after verse 3. So you can see that verses 1 through 3 are a cry from the psalmist. Something that in this, we're told in the title that David is the psalmist. So David, whenever he writes this, is reflecting back on this experience that he had. And is he writes it, of course, though, not so much as a reflection. He writes it as if he's right in the middle of it. Right? He writes as if in that moment he's crying out for deliverance. Save me, O God. Why? What had happened? It said in verse says in verse three, strangers have risen up against him, oppressions have sought after uh, oppressors have sought after my life, and he describes them as, as people who are completely outside of any fellowship of God. They're people that don't fear God. So David was in the middle of an experience where he's taken by surprise. When it says strangers, the idea of, of strangers here is uh, people who should have no reason for being upset with David, right? There's no reason why have, have sought after his life. Then the second section, verses 4 and 5, what does he do? The one who has just cried out to God, Yahweh. The one who he has just cried out to for deliverance, he affirms his faith and says, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay his enemies for their evil, right? So you get then, first you get the cry to the Lord. Then you get the affirmation of his faith that the Lord would hear him and deliver him. And then verses 6 and 7 are particularly encouraging because he says, I will, I will freely sacrifice to you. And that's a, a picture of worship in terms of the old covenant system at the tabernacle. This is written by David, so the, the temple didn't exist in David's life yet. That was built by Solomon. And, uh, and he says, I will praise your name. Um, and then, so he speaks very confidently that this is going to work out in such a way that he is going to worship the Lord. He worships the Lord as if it's already done. And verse 7 is in past tense. He has delivered me. Past tense, delivered, right? You notice verse 5, future tense. He will repay my enemies. But then verse 7 is past tense. He has delivered me out of all of my trouble. And the point there is, after he affirms his faith in God, he declares that he's going to worship God as if it was already done. So he recognizes God's sovereignty. So in those three sections, and we'll talk about some more of the details in a minute, you can see that he, uh, uh, he cries out to the Lord, he expresses his trust, his faith in the Lord, and then he expresses his confidence in God's answer and that God is going to deliver him. Now, before we go through some of the details, like I said, we're told in the title of the psalm, this is Psalm 54, by the way, Psalm 54, the, uh, 
were told in the title of an event out of which this cry was born. And that event is recorded in 1 Samuel 23. So certainly keep some kind of bookmark or something there in uh, Psalm 54 and go back to 1 Samuel 23. So what's happening here? David is not the king in 1 Samuel 23. Saul is the king at that point in history. And David is very much in danger, so it would seem, because Saul is after him to take his life. And this comes right out of the very uh, well-known event, right after the very well-known event in that period where David was on the run that uh, Saul had basically murdered a whole bunch of priests, including the high priest at the tabernacle, because, uh, because they had given aid to David while he was on the run. So very wicked, very treacherous, very dangerous times. And then here's what happens. Verse 1 of chapter 23. They told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. And they are robbing the threshing floors, Keilah being one of the cities of Judah. Therefore, David, he goes to the Lord. He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? Says something about the relationship that David had with God, doesn't it? I mean, number one, in that difficult moment, what David thinks is turn to the Lord and pray and ask God for direction and for wisdom. Good example there for us. I think. And what you see is that uh, David, even though his own life is in danger, he still has on his mind, what does the Lord want from me? What does the Lord want me to do? You can see why God describes David as one who's after his own heart, right? So David inquires of the Lord and says, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah, right? But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Right? Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand, a survivor from when all those priests were slain. Right? So just to follow everything that's gone on now, David's men were like, we're in danger in our own country, in Judah, you know, and you want us to go over to this city and to defend these people. So he goes back to the Lord and asks him again, David does, and the Lord again answers and says, I'm going to deliver them into your hand, don't worry. So David rallies his men and they go down and they fight against the Philistines and they win, right? So you would think that the reaction of the inhabitants of Keilah would be what? some gratitude and some loyalty to David. There's no indication that David had any personal connection with any of the people of this city. All he knew was that the Philistines had attacked the city. So he asked the Lord, do you want me to go and defend the inhabitants of this city? God says, yes. He asks again, are you sure? Basically, God says, yes, I'm going to deliver them. So he goes down and he attacks the Philistines and looks like he wins a, a, a very, very convincing victory, even taking away their livestock. So the people of Keilah must have been like, wow, look at this. Look at how David was uh, being used by the Lord and granted this great victory. David is our, our one who has delivered us. So then Abiathar uh, comes down with the ephod. And then verse 7 says, Saul, flick, flipping over to Saul now, who was hunting for David, Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. 
right? So Saul sees this as his opportunity to pounce on David because David fought for and defended this city. And Saul sees, aha, this, this, this entrapped basically by winning this city. He's stuck in this city now, so I can go and attack him. So Saul called the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Keep in mind that context. This is the king of Israel, Saul, who is on chasing the one whom Samuel has anointed to be king of Israel, David. This is Saul, the king that the people wanted, chasing after David, the one who God wanted. All right? When David knew, verse 9 says, that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver you. Look, we've all had moments in our lives where maybe not quite as much as stake as this, but, you know, we're serving the Lord we're pouring ourselves out in service to the Lord. We're doing our best. We're praying for people. We're trying to do good to as many people as we possibly can, all because of our love for Jesus. Not trying to earn our salvation, but walking in those good works and good deeds that the Lord has laid out before us and has empowered us to do, has called us to do. We're just applying all diligence and all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to like walking in the things that the Lord in his will has shown us and wants us to do. And we're trying to serve and do good to as many people as we can. You see what happens when David does that? He defends a city, but then God says, okay, now the people of the city that you just saved, when Saul comes down, they're going to turn you over. There's a couple of lessons there. Number one, you see how quickly in many instances David turns to prayer. That is an example for us. Really, Psalm 54, when we get back to it, what is it? It's a prayer, right? So you and I, when we get into these instances, don't just sit in the middle of them by yourself. When struggles arise, when attacks come, when, when, when persecution or trouble or, or, or people are just after you when you've just been trying to humbly and honestly do good, you know, like... There is no reason David refers to them as strangers in Psalm 54. There's no reason why these people should be against David. He just saves them, right? You may have instances in your life where you've just tried to be good to people and they turn around and it turns around and you end up being treated poorly or being treated badly. What do you do? Do what David did. Go to the Lord. Don't don't like try to play the games that other people play. Don't try to get sucked into things where you're just operating in what is your own strength or your own cleverness or or you know fight fire with fire or all these other like kind of earthly carnal sorts of concepts that might pop into your head i mean our own earthly inclination in our old life before we knew christ is when any whenever any trouble comes fight back fight dirty if you need to do whatever you know that's not the way of jesus may i say to you we're supposed to pray even for our enemies, right? And there are a number of Psalms where David has this issue where he's kind of lamenting before God that people are against him when he's been good to them for no apparent reason. Well, here's one of those instances. Now, so learn from that example of David. When these issues come up, don't get all bent out of shape or flustered over it, even if it hurts. Turn to the Lord in prayer. You see what God did when David turned to him in prayer? He saved his life. If David had not prayed and said, are these people going to turn me over to King Saul? If David had not asked God that, there's no indication that God would have said that to him. So David might have stayed inside that barred city and fell victim to Saul when he came. But he prayed. And when he prayed, he received the wisdom that he needed to act and to move himself and his men to safety, which is what he does. 
Verse 13, so David and his men, about 600 of them, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. It seems like they, they scattered and went different places. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah. So he halted the expedition and uh, escaped is certainly one way to put it. It's the way the Bible puts it, so it's right. But it wasn't just he escaped on his own. He escaped because the Lord had answered his prayer and told him what he needed to know so he could get out of there. So God gets a lot of credit for delivering David there. And David, now here's where the direct connection to Psalm 54 comes. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness, right? He's hiding in caves and such. And remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Now look how God intervenes here. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, that's very famous, the good relationship that David had with the son of King Saul, Jonathan. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant, which is very famous, before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Then the Ziphites, ready? The Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding with us in the strongholds of the woods? David, it seems, can't catch a break. Everywhere he goes, he's just good to people, but people just keep turning on him, right? So here comes Saul, which is not, who has not, ex, has not shown really anything close to, you think, the faithfulness that God would expect from a king of Israel. And God has already anointed someone to take his place through Samuel, right? And you have all of these people showing their loyalty to Saul, who was the one who was judged on the way out, and betraying David, the one who was anointed by Samuel to be king. So, uh, so the Ziphites now, first it was the people from the city of Keilah, now it's the Ziphites, the ones who live in this wilderness, going to Saul and saying, uh, isn't David hiding here with us? Come on, come and have him, come get him. Uh, verse 20, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul and come down and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hands. Now look at what Saul's reaction is in verse 21. Blessed are you of the Lord. Suddenly, suddenly Saul becomes all spiritual, right? Because he says these people who are betraying God's anointed one into his hand, he's saying they're blessed by the Lord, right? That's, we know that's not the way it works out. Saul is deluded. He's deluded by just a sense of pride and, of course, his constantly expressed insecurity. He has been rejected by God. And David is Saul's choice. Even his own son, Jonathan, recognizes that. Now David is still in great danger. And David is grieved because he is, at first, the, the, the people of Keilah that he saved and defended. And now he's in the wilderness. And the people of the, that area, the Ziphites, they're ready to just hand him over to Saul. Well, I'm going to stop the reading there. You can read where it goes. He ends up being delivered out of that. When you go over to chapter 26, you see basically the same thing happens there. Chapter 26 and verse 1, the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah. They did it again and said, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakilah opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph again, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped there. But again, uh, if you read the rest of it, you'll see that David is delivered out of his hand uh, pretty dramatically. Even if you go down to verse 7, he sees him sleeping. David sees Saul sleeping and has the opportunity to kill him and famously does not kill him. He spares Saul's life, showing uh, that, again, I'm no threat to you, right? This is one of the great dilemmas of 
David's life before he becomes king as a servant of God. He is trying and trying and trying to seek the Lord and obey the Lord and honor the Lord. He is trying and trying and trying to be good, even to Saul who's trying to kill him. He's trying to be good to the people of this city and fight and defend them. He's trying to be good and represent the Lord and, and be godly and be obedient to the Lord wherever he goes. And yet even in that instance there where he had the opportunity to kill Saul, he would not do it. He's trying to be good and all he's finding is what? People turning against him, turning against him, turning against him. Do you ever experience that in life? Look at Psalm 54. So again, Psalm 54 now. This is the psalm that comes out of all of this. Now you understand the title of Psalm 54, which says, To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, Is David not hiding with us? Which I say happened to him twice and before that even was the betrayal of the dwellers of the city of Keilah. Now you know what he's crying out for when he says, Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me. Who, who were the Keolites? Who were the Ziphites? They weren't anybody that should have anything against David, right? They've sought after my life. They have not set God before them. See, David recognizes that these people, they don't, they don't fear God at all, even though David, as the future king of Israel, is trying to minister and to be good to them. And then you see the Selah, which basically means pause. It means stop and think about it. Think about it. Save me, O God, by your name. No matter what, whether it's betrayal, being dealt evil, even when you're attempting only to do good and be obedient to God, whatever trial or difficulty comes into your life, those first words, save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. The lesson for the believer and translating this into the terms of being a new covenant believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. David lived in the era of a different covenant, but it's always been true that God justifies those who have faith, right? All the way back to Abraham, we see in Scripture that's true. So the concept carries over. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who have recognized our own sinfulness and knowing that God has saved us from our sins. When we run into these instances as we are serving God, which is all David was trying to do, as we he's ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? Tells him what to do, goes and does it. You're trying to serve the Lord. You know, when you run into these instances, what should you do? Turn to God and pray and rest and wait. Save me, O God. How? How do you say, say save? Save me by your name vindicate me by your strength right he doesn't he's not looking to lash out at anybody he just goes to the lord and he trusts the lord save me by your name not by mine by yours save me by your strength not by man's by yours O lord you turn to the lord right and he expresses his concern that's it in verse three we explained it already the strangers the oppressors people have people who don't fear god happens all the time people that don't fear god even if they have no cause really to be so angry and vengeful towards you that they're seeking after your life it happens right what do you do you turn to the lord and you pray what do you pray you pray for deliverance you pray for strength for yourself that comes from the lord but what else do you pray according to jesus you even pray for your enemies you pray for people who oppress you you pray for people who persecute you. Listen, when Jesus was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When Stephen was stoned to death, you know, the first martyr in Acts chapter 7, as he was about to die, he prayed, don't charge them with this sin. You know? Look, if we're in Christ, 
whatever hardship or battle we might go through this life, if we're in Christ, our sins have been removed. We have been delivered. Like David expresses at the end of this psalm as if his deliverance is done. If you have faith in Christ, your deliverance is done. We don't fear what man may do to us. We turn to the Lord for strength. Now look, sometimes disputes among believers arise. Those things should be settled quickly and with humility, with peace, and with love, preferring others to ourselves, putting the interests of others ahead of our own, caring mostly, chiefly for the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of the gospel and the testimony of the church and not wanting to do any harm to any of that. We try to bring peace and settle things. No time for it tonight, but there are plenty of passages of Scripture that give us instruction in that regard. However, ultimately, David understood Though he's troubled deeply by all of this, he has no control over it. He turns to the one who does. He turns to the Lord, right? We need to be people who are just so well trained in our walk with Jesus that when these things happen, we turn to God in prayer. There's the takeaway from that section of Psalm 54. Then verses 4 and 5, he simply expresses his confidence. God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life, right? He is confident that God is not only with him, but God is with those who are on his side. God is with those who are encouraging him and helping him. And he says, he will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. You know what that is? That verse 5 reads like it's a verse that says, yeah, God's going to get them. That's not how I read it. I read verse 5 and it, my heart gets filled with compassion. I don't really want the Lord to have to do that to anybody. That's why we need to pray. That's why Jesus, Jesus is such the... Jesus is so counterintuitive to what humans in their natural depravity would think. Isn't that true? Jesus is glorious, and he's wonderful, he's awesome, he's gracious. That's why Jesus says to pray for your enemies. We don't rejoice in what verse 5 says, that he's going to repay his enemies for their evil. God will do that because God is sovereign and God is righteous and God is holy and we should rejoice that God will ultimately do what's right. But as I'm walking day by day in this life, we need to pray for people, man. Even people that are against us and spitefully use us and persecute us and, and despise us and everything else. We need to be praying for people because, listen, we are speeding, rushing, close, close, close to the end of things, I believe, to that moment when the rapture of the church happens, when the, the great tribulation begins on the earth, ultimately we arrive at the point of the, the return of the Lord Jesus, and man, all the judgment and destruction that goes on in that time, that ultimately the great coronation, if you will, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords re-entering uh, earth to, to establish the kingdom of God here for a thousand years. We're getting close to that point. People need to come to Christ. People need to repent. People need to believe the gospel. We're not going through life spiting people, arguing with people, fighting with people. We're here as ambassadors of Christ. So we should be praying for people, right? Turn to the Lord. Pray for strength. Pray for salvation. Pray for deliverance. Pray for comfort when you come into difficult things like David is. But even in the terms, in the thought process of the Gospels and of the New Covenant, pray for the people that are against you that God would grant them repentance and faith. Isn't that better? Isn't that the best thing of all? Isn't it the best thing of all that all people are repentant and humble and come to faith in Christ, real faith in Christ? 
and then in the context of being part of the body of the Christ, love one another and be a testimony to the world? Is not God ultimately best glorified when people turn from their evil deeds in humility to God in faith and the presence of the Holy Spirit changes them and transforms them? That's where we should be praying for people. And then the third thing, worship. Verses 6 and 7. I will freely sacrifice to you. In the terms of the old covenant, what is sacrifice? It's literally sacrificing, bringing animals to the priests at the altar that they might be sacrificed for this or that. You can read about that in Exodus. You can read about it in Leviticus. You can read about it in Deuteronomy. You know, uh, but that whole system, all that did was pointed ahead to the one-time sacrifice that would be made to take our sins away, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. And so now what should we do? We bring sacrifice to him in a much different way, don't we? The sacrifice that we bring is our faith. The sacrifice that we bring is our humility. The sacrifice that we bring is the worship of God because of what Jesus has done. The sacrifice we bring are the praises, the fruit of our lips, as Hebrews says, the praise to our God. We bring the, uh, the offering, the sacrifice of our obedience. We bring the sacrifice of our service. We bring the sacrifice of just laying down our own lives and picking up our cross and following after him. We bring the sacrifice of devoting ourselves to him as his servants, as he has delivered us and saved us. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Yahweh, for it is good. Is it not? Is not the name of Yahweh good? Is not the name of Jesus also good? Is it not God who himself gave one name under heaven by which all men must be saved? And that is the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. For he, notice again the past tense, he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Look, one of two things will happen. You pray for people. They will humble themselves. They will, they will repent. You pray to God and ask him to show you, is there anything you've contributed to a conflict? Ask him to open your own eyes that if you need to, you need to repent. Pray for people that they might humble themselves and truly believe the gospel and be saved. One of two things, which are both in the hands of a sovereign God, will happen. Deliverance will come and you will praise him. Or God's righteous judgment will come and you will praise him. The important thing is that you trust in a sovereign God to do his will. Psalm 54 comes out of an experience where David had been multiple times wronged by the betrayal of people who had no real reason for being opposed to him to the point that they wanted him dead. And he cries out to the Lord. The Lord guides him, gives him direction, gives him wisdom. David cries out to God. That's what we need to learn to do in trial and in hardship, cry out to God. David expresses his faith in the Lord. That's what you and I need to do. Trust in the Lord that he knows what he's doing and pray for people. And then thirdly, he expresses his confidence that one way or another, a sovereign God in his time will bring a culmination to all of it either a transformation and deliverance and repentance and faith of those who do wrong or their judgment in the end. Whatever God does will glorify God, but my job is to trust him and to serve him no matter what. Praise the Lord. That's Psalm 54. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, most holy Lord God, that you permit in your sovereignty us to go through difficult seasons, even as we try to serve you and do good in the world. The world doesn't always see that or appreciate that. We may be persecuted or uh, reviled, betrayed. But Lord, we can see even from the life of David here that because our reward is not here and now in this life, suffering and hardship, patience and long-suffering with joy, 
That's what you call us to, Lord. Help us to learn that lesson. Help us to learn to pray to you. Help us to learn to trust in you. And help us to learn to worship you. For in the end, all things will be done in accordance with your will. I pray that anybody listening to this tonight, Lord God, if they're one of your chosen servants, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that they would be comforted by these words and learn to just go to you in prayer with everything immediately and wait on you for guidance and comfort and deliverance. And if anyone is listening to this tonight, Lord God, who is just tuned in, maybe curious, maybe listening to it afterwards, and they're not like in the kingdom yet, they haven't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you grant it to them, Lord, that they would recognize that their own sinfulness keeps them separated from you and really judged by you in a really precarious place, destined for death and destined for hell. But your love caused you to give Jesus your son who gave his life for our sins and rose from the dead. And that is your power to save and deliver people. And may that person listening tonight who needs you turn to you in faith. As many as receive you, Lord Jesus, the word says you give them power to become the children of God, those who believe on your name. Save those who need saving, Lord. Comfort and teach those who need comfort and instruction. All for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I hope this was comforting for you. It certainly is for me. Uh, instructive for me as well as comforting. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, guys, for being here. Nice to see a good crowd in the Bible study here tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you who have joined in here online. And um, let's see, a couple of things I'll mention now. Uh, we are going to have, it looks like Sunday is going to be a really nice day. It's going to be hot, but it should be nice to be outside. So Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to have our, uh, it's a bring your own lunch fellowship, not quite a full bang picnic, you know, but we're going to be outside. We'll set up some tables and we can all have some fellowship together outside. You bring your lunch over at two o'clock and we're going to sit outside and have lunch together and have some fellowship. You come to church in the morning or if you stay home and you watch it online, either way at two o'clock, all of us come on over and we'll join in together in the afternoon. And speaking of the Sunday morning service, that's the next time that we'll be online here, uh, 10 o'clock, Sunday morning. You're welcome to come in person. You're welcome to join in here online. Either way, one way or the other, be here, be part of it. Enter in, worship the Lord, and fellowship together. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Good night.